The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us for another webinar of Chat with Green Aggies, where we have some of our uh, county agents, horticulturalists, entomologists, plant pathologists with the Texas A&M system delivering time-relevant, hopefully time-relevant information to you on a weekly basis at 1212 on Thursdays. That's a 12th man reference if you haven't gotten it yet, so hopefully it's kind of easy for you to remember. Gives you a bit of time to mix up your ramen noodles or warm up your, I don't know, food from the evening before, before jumping onto the webinar. Uh, I'm going to be doing the uh, feature presentation. So I think we started with last week based on feedback from you, the listeners, uh, to have, like say, a feature presentation every single time. Uh, and then uh, the others will give another five or 10 minute update based on a particular area. So mine is going to be on. Thrips, Thrips Biology, Damage and Management. So I think any of you listening are probably far more than familiar, far more than you'd like uh, with Thrips. They are a devastating pest for not just ornamentals, but obviously uh, vegetables and fruit crops and a lot of row crops as well. So we're gonna do kind of a deep dive on Thrips. They're in this group known as Thysanoptera. There's over 6,000 described species of thrips. All right, so there's a, there's a lot. Uh, and there's two kind of main categories we can think of, tubulifera, which lays eggs outside of the host material, whereas terebranchia lays eggs inside the plant tissue. So a lot of the ones we deal with, for example, the Western flower thrips is in that terebranchia. They, they typically lay their eggs in and or uh, kind of like a little bit inside the tissues. I mean, hard to kind of contact with, say, a contact insecticide. They have fringed wings. So if you look at all these wings here, you can see there's uh, these hairs on there, but that's not unique to only thrips. Other insects have those hairs on the wings as well. And they exploit, whether it be immature, mature, and senescing leaves and flowers. And some can be predators. Now, this is kind of an interesting um, one to throw in there that Western flower thrips feed on spider mite eggs. So if you have, uh, let's say, a small population of thrips uh, and a small population of spider mites and you treat your thrips, you could inadvertently be increasing your spider mite population, depending on what you just applied. So it doesn't hurt to look for those types of patterns. If you are uh, spraying for thrips and every time you do or Frequently when you do, you see a spider mite population explosion. Keep an eye out for that. See if you can use other methods like preventing thrips from getting in there in the first place or do a quick follow-up with uh, spider mite applications. So you have to have that uh, secondary management plan ready to go. In terms of general life cycle, right? So they're laying their eggs, like I mentioned, on and or in plant tissue. And we have the first and second instar larvae where they're already starting to feed very small in this stage, really helps to have a head lens or a hand lens uh, to be able to see them on the actual plant. And we'll look at some monitoring strategies here in a bit. And then they're going into this pre-pupil and pupil stage, usually in and or on the soil, sometimes on the leaves, but usually on the media that the plant is growing in. And so as you can imagine, if we're, when we're talking about insecticide applications, a lot of them will ask to spray on a seven or 14 day interval. And the purpose is to break this life cycle because if you spray and you hit all of these above, you're gonna have this these pupa and pre-pupa and merge a few days later. So it's kind of that, that seven day window, that seven day, uh, you know, twice in a seven day period is kind of that sweet window in order to get the newly emerged pre-pupa and pupa, and only the, uh, only the adults are winged. Pardon me. The average size is about 3 64ths of an inch to 1 8th of an inch. I converted that fraction for you so that Becky wouldn't have to try this time. Uh, and they have rather uniform morphology, right? They're pretty slender. Uh, once you've seen one thrips, and yes, the singular form of thrips is thrips. Once you've seen one thrips, you've kind of seen them all in terms of general structure and morphology. They're kind of slender and very small. Um, and, you know, we spoke about how many described species they are. Well, about one third of total publications, research publications, are on Western flower thrips in the last 30 years. So, uh, even though there's a whole lot of them, there's there's a very small subset that are very economically important. And, you know, within that, even a group that's very common that is studied, you know, by far the most. 
So you have uh, rasping, sucking mouth parts. Uh, you can see here in this image, and so the type of damage they cause is similar to sucking damage. You can see this uh, kind of stippling and discoloration. You can see on a flower as an example, you almost get a little bit more mechanical damage as well compared to say a, a sucking insect because they're actually scratching at that leaf surface and then when it bleeds out, then they're sucking up those juices. Whereas a sucking insect basically, you know, has a very tiny little straw that's going in between cells and going in and feeding in. So you're not getting as much mechanical damage. And some of them will produce uh, some black spots, which is their frass, such as the Western flower thrips, depending on the uh, amount of, of the population. Sorry, and so can you one thing that's frass? Frass is poop. Yeah. Uh, so they're excrement, right? So what they're excreting after they have eaten a delicious meal, which is your awesome plant. Uh, and so thrips also, they vector tospel viruses. So this is a group of viruses specific, specifically vectored by thrips which is where they can become of extreme concern. So, you know, there's there's some work done here just showing the number of tospel viruses and what uh, thrip species can transmit them. So Franklin yellow occidentalis, that's our Western flower thrips, can, for example, transmit the chrysanthemum stem necrosis virus. Fortunately for us, we don't have those in North America yet. Once we do, you'll start to have to space your plants six feet apart and put surgical masks on them. So be sure to stock up on those now while you can. You won't actually have to do that. But, but fortunately, we, we don't have that one right now. Some of the most common that we need to consider, um, and you know, Dr. Ann Chase, many of you are probably familiar with her, um, you know, very good plant pathologist, uh, wrote a nice little article kind of outlining um, some of the main uh, pathogens to look out for. So if you just Google how to identify and fight them, TOSPO viruses in Greenhouse Management Magazine, you can find that article. But the three main ones uh, that they vector that, that are of major concern in ornamentals are then patients' necrotic spot virus, the tomato spotted wilt virus, and tobacco streak, uh, streak virus. And do we have do we have Kevin on here today? I was going to pick his brain no, a couple times, but oh, okay, gotcha. So the impatience necrotic uh, spot virus, you can see here on the left side some of the symptomology on coleus. Uh, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do a deep dive on these viruses because you you know we could spend a whole lecture on just these and how the symptoms can vary um, from from species to species of plant. But there are these test kits for INSV that are rapid uh, for the field use. This is where, I don't know if any of you have had any experience that's going to pick um, Kevin Ong's brain about the cost, uh, how often you get positive negatives, I mean, or sorry, false false negatives, and uh, how effective these tests are. Do any of you know? Crickets. All right. So, no, we'll just keep kind of going on. But, uh, yeah, so there are these tests that um, can be potentially very valuable if they give you a quick turnaround in the field of whether you have this virus or not. Uh, there's also the tomato spotted wilt virus. You can see on geranium where you get these uh, kind of spots and rings more like, and gloxinia as well. And lastly, tobacco streak, uh, streak virus as well that almost looks just like some kind of sucking damage but it's actually a type of a virus, and this is on hosta. So again, the symptomology can vary a lot between different species. Some of these can go across several different species, and, and that is a whole thing on its own. So if you suspect you might have some kind of a plant virus, make sure to contact the plant diagnostic clinic, Dr. Kevin Ong, and submit a sample for testing. So when it comes to actually monitoring for thrips, there's a few different techniques that can be very handy. One is sticky cards, and if you go back to our uh, video from April 23rd, do a bit of a you know a, a shallow dive into you know thrips uh, color preference and going into blue versus uh, yellow cards and which one you should pick if you have that choice. And uh, you know in summary, it seems as though yellow. So this is looking at average number of thrips caught every two weeks per two feet of sticky tape. Uh, whether it's a yellow one, so this is over weeks, uh, blue one, or a blue and a blue patterned one. And you can see yellow consistently trapped more thrips. And this seems to be kind of the census, right? There might be some instances where blue is better, but the census is, is that um, yellow appears to be more consistently uh, effective at trapping thrips. Again, you can go back to that earlier video if you want to see some more details on that.
Something to note here, right, is that um, the number of thrips caught here, right, it's like 150 up to 250, uh, and again, this is per two feet of tape, uh, of that, that sticky tape. So it, you know, it can, it's providing some reasonable uh, suppression of the thrips at the least. And so as a monitoring technique and as a uh, trapping technique, there are these long rolls of tape that you can stretch around the perimeter of some of your crops to trap uh, thrips. We also have the beet technique. Uh, so thrips can be very hard to see on flowers or on actual leaves. So one thing we do is basically hitting that flower. I'm gonna I'm gonna re-show you that incredible animation right there. I mean, just marvelous, right? So by hitting that flower, you're hitting onto a piece of white paper or white foam board that's inside a plastic sleeve, and you can dislodge them out of that flower onto there, and it's a lot easier to see them. So uh, I'll often have one of these if I'm monitoring or scouting out somewhere as a way to uh, quickly see thrips on, on a plant. We also have aspirators. So that's where you have a vial, uh, one end which you're uh, sucking in, and then there's the vial, and then there's a little filter uh, here to prevent yourself from eating that insect. So unless you're planning on eating it, make sure that filter is present. Uh, but that way you're basically aspirating these insects. If you need to submit it for identification, you need to take a closer look under a microscope, this is an excellent resource. And lastly, never underestimate the importance of plant inspection. So by actually looking at the undersides of leaves, again, it really helps. You can get these jeweler lenses from Amazon for 20 or 30 bucks, get yourself two and a half, three and a half times magnification. You can get clip-on lenses for your phones, you know, give you 10 times magnification. You know, a reasonable lens is anywhere between, you're looking at 40 bucks to 130 bucks for clipping onto your smartphone. And so uh, you can get, you know, some much better photos and some good field diagnostics that way. Now, uh, again, if you Google Pest Thrips of the United States Field Identification Guide, you'll find this PDF uh, for free, and it's an excellent resource for helping you to identify some of your thrips. And we're gonna go through just a few of the key ones that you might find straight out of that identification guide. And just before I do, um, a colleague up in Canada, Sarah, um, you know, basically scouted uh, thrips on a number of different types of crops. You can see here the different uh, crops down here at the bottom. And this is uh, proportion, mean proportion of the different species of thrips that were on those crops. And you can see Western flower thrips is typically the dominant thrips, uh, except for in some cases. So Mandevilla and Gerbera, we have uh, onion thrips as well. Onion thrips can be pretty common here too. We also have chili thrips are a lot more common here than they are up there. And uh, lastly, echino thrips, especially on poinsettias, are pretty common too. So those are some of the ones that we're gonna uh, kind of go through. So starting off with echino thrips, they have this dark body and you can see it's a light colored uh, wing with a dark band on there. And they're mostly found on the undersides of leaves and that's where you're gonna find the immatures as well. So on poinsettias, I'd often find two or three of these kind of close to each other on the underside of the leaf. And it's really hard to tell. It almost looks like a you know particle of dust or almost like a um, one of the hairs of the poinsettias. The signs really start disturbing and it starts moving around a little bit that you can see that it's, it's something living. It's its own little organism. Uh, one of the poinsettia hairs didn't decide to start crawling around. Uh, and so they're on the undersides of those leaves. But they'll also get on hibiscus, ficus, and pasians, and a few other uh, crops as well. We have western flower thrips. You'll see here I put also known as cotton thrips. That's very relevant because if you're close to a cotton field, or they get on a lot of fruits and vegetables as well. So if you're close to a fruit and vegetable field and they've just harvested or plowed or whatever, um, you might have all of a sudden a huge armada of Western flower thrips coming into your greenhouse. So that's something to be aware of. If you can, ideally, we'll see a little bit later about how to screen a greenhouse, uh, but if that's impractical, then you need, to, you need to be proactive about starting to manage those thrips. Uh, so they range from pale to dark and they have what appears to be a dark strip when those wings are laying down flat. Uh, and the matures have red eyes. You'll see it doesn't look really red, so I don't know if that's the best diagnostic uh, feature out in the field. And it can sometimes be kind of hard to distinguish between uh, onion and melon, uh, and melon thrips as well in the field. So 
can be a little bit tricky. It does help to uh, look at it under some magnification. Now it does prefer to feed on flowers, but will also feed on leaves, fruits, stems, and like I mentioned earlier, spider mites, right? So they are also considered um, facultative predators, right? So they will feed on other insects if they are there. Um, and you know, some papers have even described them as having a proclivity towards predation. So they they almost like have a desire. We'll we'll, um, we'll seek out uh, spider mites to feed on them. Uh, onion thrips, all right, have very long hairs uh, on their wings. You can see right here, yellow to dark brown, and uh, mostly problematic on fruits and vegetables, but can also feed on uh, ornamentals as well. And lastly, we have our chili thrips, which you can see looks kind of similar to our onion thrips, right? It has this dark banding or blotching as well, and pretty hairy wings, but it's got these uh, three red dots, right? So those are the ocelli, which are basically very simple eyes for detecting just changes in light, right? So they don't really have the ability to focus or uh, really resolve images that well, but they can see very simple things. And they feed primarily on new uh, foliage and flower buds. However, uh, if you've dealt with them, you've probably also seen them feeding in, on, on like stems and as a result causing rose rosette-like symptoms. All right, so that's uh, this, this thrips right here can be that culprit. So again, if you're having difficulty identifying, that's where, um, you know, if you submitted a sample, we can look at it under a slide. And you can see there's some major um, size differences here, right? So this is 0 0.13 millimeter scale, or this is 0.22. Um, what that means is, you know, these are two times basically difference in size, right? So this one's um, the Western flower thrips is substantially larger. And then we have the Western flower thrips and the uh, onion thrips can be similar in size, but then have some distinguishing features like the onion thrips having some of that uh, banding or, or blotching. So in terms of prevention, if you have some highly infested uh, plant materials, you want to make sure to get rid of that, especially if it's older material, don't hold on to it, toss it, especially with how expensive insecticides are and how hard it can be to control them. Uh, that can, They can act as reservoirs uh, to, to keep infesting some of your other materials. Pruning, if you have some senescing flowers or flowers are just starting to fall, try and bag them up, uh, collect them off, you know, before they fall off, bag them, seal it, and get it out of there. Because again, that could be a source of population. So if they're falling down, you're going to have all of those thrips charging out onto your, back onto your plant. And lastly, netting. So there is some what's called thrips proof netting. So in this case, you can see they've had to build an extra structure that increases the surface area of the netting. Uh, and that's all related to airflow. Right? If you built that net directly onto the uh, the, the swamp the swamp pad or the cooling pad here, it would not provide enough uh, airflow for for ventilation. So you have to create an extra frame and you know whatever manufacturer you're working with to to acquire this thrips proof netting usually would be able to provide some of those specifications. In terms of biological control, I'm not going to do a deep dive here because there's a lot involved in uh, releasing natural enemies um, and, and monitoring and making sure that you're using them effectively. I, you know, there are many places, so for example in Canada, where they rely mostly on beneficial insects. Only if there's a flare-up of certain populations of thrips will they then go in and, and spray them with something with low residual just to knock their populations back down so they can be managed by the beneficials again. So a number of predatory mites, uh, and there's also uh, some predatory sucking insects, and lastly, uh, we have beneficial nematodes. If you're a professional landscaper, the important thing to keep note here is, you know, it's not, you don't want to release these beneficials, you just want to not kill them. All right, so if you're using broad spectrums like uh, seven dust, for example, can exacerbate this problem by having some, some negative effects on the predators. So you just want to be careful about what you're using uh, so that you don't cause the problem because you have a lot of these beneficial insects and these natural predators already suppressing populations in the field. So now we get to the last bit, we're looking at insecticidal control, all right? Um, so there, these, these things are very hard to control, even with insecticides, okay? So, um, you know, and I'm talking even in favorable conditions where 
we're doing, you know, we're treating one plant in a cage and we're getting good coverage. So it depends on the insecticide you're using. It can be kind of kind of difficult. Coverage is key, so make sure you're getting good coverage. Again, breaking that life cycle. So you have some of those pre-pupa and pupa, and when they emerge, you want to hit them. You want to rotate modes of action to avoid insecticide resistance. We'll see that here in a moment. So there are a couple uh, really good resources that I used for providing you all this data you're about to see uh, in terms of insecticides for thrips. One is the IR4 project, which um, they basically have researchers all over the US conduct efficacy trials, and then all this data is actually made publicly accessible uh, on their website. I'll show you here in a moment, I made a quick tutorial video on how to navigate uh, this website. And another one is arthropod management tests, which is also open source, and again, is all very simple, uh, straightforward uh, insecticide uh, tests. So um, this, uh, we can, I think we'll, we'll give this out in a handout next week, possibly. Um, so I have an Excel spreadsheet that summarizes all of this for you, or you can take a screenshot or whatever you like. But uh, you'll see here the trade names uh, here on the left. Mention of trade names is not an endorsement, right? These are just some examples, and I, I, I very well may have missed some here. Um, we have the active ingredient, the REI, re-entry interval, and the mode of action number. So you always want to make sure to rotate the numbers, not just letters within numbers. So rotating a 4A and 4B is not really considered sufficient. You've got to rotate a 4 with a 6 or a 4 with a 5 or whatever. And then we have efficacy. And this is based on, you know, so there might be like 10 studies. So here, for example, I found more than 10 studies on IR4, and every single one provided either good to excellent control. But some others, for example, six studies, that I found some that were poor to moderate control. And it can vary a lot. And it might depend on the crop that it's on. It might depend on where it was applied, the specific species of thrips. Uh, so there's many things to consider. So when you're thinking about your rotation, you might consider things that are consistently good regardless of conditions. So you want to look for things that have several studies done and provide good to excellent control. Uh, here's another group of, of insecticides. So this is a, a three-page long. So if you want to grab a, a snapshot of that as well, you can feel free to do so. And again, um, a lot of um, excellent insecticides, including one that we mentioned, you know, it was last time or two times ago, uh, Pradia, which is that uh, relatively new insecticide from OHP um, that has also shown so far, so again, only two studies, so we need more, uh, but seems to be pretty promising as well. And uh, this is the last one. So again, if you want to stop for a, a moment in case you want to grab a nice little snapshot, Again, some of this you, you might already know, but if there are any insecticides that, you know, you're trying to add something into rotation, you see it's good to excellent, then you might want to uh, flip it into there. Like I mentioned, uh, I've made two, actually, tutorial videos. I just recently posted on the YouTubes. Uh, if you search up IR4 database or IR4 summaries, I go through how to navigate that raw data, and I also go through how to navigate IR4 crazy summaries on all the data related to, say, thrips control, thrips efficacy. And this is like, I think it was over a 200 page document. And I kind of go through what, what are the key parts of that document to look at. So you're not having to peep, read those 200 pages. Uh, near the end of the document, our summary for each insecticide is like an overall summary of how it worked on, in this case, say, thrips. But they also have it for your mealybugs or spider mites and so on and so forth. So that concludes uh, my bit on thrips. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Erifon. Um I just want to let you know that uh, we uh, will provide uh, Erifon's handouts in the, next, uh, in the next weekly chat, because this week we have already have like five handouts for you. So <laughs> five handouts. So check the, uh, uh, check the, uh, the, the uh, you know, the handout. There's a, there's a handout, a panel there. Um, uh, check that. Uh, so in the handouts, we have two uh, daily uh, rust uh, handouts and three EAB, emerald ash borer. Um, so because, you know, this has been an emerging uh, issue. Uh, Laura, you want to speak on this? Uh, so this has been the hot topic in North Texas. Um, am I talking or? Okay, um, good. All right, this has been the thing. Everybody's, everybody's calling, emailing, sending me pictures of D-shaped exit holes and, you know, it's just happening. Um, 
but this is emerald ash borer. Uh, it was identified in Tarrant County in December of 2017. So that's been a little while. Um, as you may know, the Texas A&M Forest Service has been trapping for this pest for probably 10 years now, uh, regularly looking for it. And it's been in East Texas for about five years. So it's, it's here in Texas, but detection has been really spotty. And the find in Tarrant County was very unusual because it was so far from the counties in far East Texas, which are all up against the Louisiana borderline. Denton County, of course, is just north of Tarrant County, so it's not really that weird, but this is outside of the 15 mile radius where you would expect to find more emerald ash borer. So city forester Haywood Morgan with the city of Denton was asked to come look at some declining ash trees in a neighborhood. And this neighborhood had about 20% from what I understand of the trees in the neighborhood were ash trees. You can kind of see, you know, in the picture, looking down the street, um, he was out looking at the tree and then Mung uh, Mung used to change the super saw. Um, he was out looking at the trees and uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, happened to notice a little green insect that he caught and um, sent to Dr. Mike Merchant a picture and also um, called Courtney Blevins and Courtney uh, sent the insect, I believe, to Alan Smith, the entomologist with the Texas A&M Forest Service, and it will be identified, but it does really look like emerald ash borer. Um, you can see the little picture of it there on the penny. And he also uh, looked at the tree and found the characteristic kind of tunneling under the bark of the tree and a little bit, thanks for the cursor there, D-shaped exit hole. And that D-shaped exit hole is about an eighth of an inch. So it's a very small D-shaped exit hole there. Um, this is big news just because it's a, a new county. Um, as you may know, this is a quarantine pest. So the counties are, are under a quarantine. I'd like to give a big shout out to all of our mulch makers who really, when it happened in Tarrant County, they jumped right on complying with the requirements for the mulch size uh, and everything they had to do, they really decided to be part of the solution uh, to managing emerald ash borer and really took, took a proactive effort to make sure that they weren't part of the problem. But um, ashes do make up a small part of our urban forest. Our native ashes are mostly in riparian areas. All along the Trinity River, there's quite a few ashes. So that's probably a place where they're gonna spread the emerald ash borer. In neighborhoods like the city of Denton, their tree survey only had about 4% ash in the city. So it's not a, you know, it's not up and down every, every street like it was in some of the places that were most devastated in the Midwest. But it's a big deal, new county. Um, everybody should be looking for these. The adults are out and about right now. April, May is their, their time. It's kind of a pretty little insect there. You can see it's a metallic green. Um, you'll also maybe notice notching on leaf margins. That's kind of how they eat the adults. They eat leaves. So you might see that, that characteristic notching. But the overall decline of the tree is the main symptom of, of emerald ash borer infestation. Does anybody have questions about anything? Let's, uh, no? let's keep going and then they would, uh, the audience could uh, type okay. their questions in the uh, question panel. Uh, you know, if you raise your hand, just go ahead, type your question in the question panel and we'll answer it uh, at the end of the, uh, the, the chat. And, um, and don't forget, uh, go to the uh, uh, handout panel to download all five uh, handouts, especially if you're in the uh, North uh, Texas area. We have three and uh, three handouts, you know, about the identification and stuff like that. Hopefully, uh, that will be very uh, uh, useful. Our uh, next one is from uh, Paul Linsky. Paul is our uh, Harris County Extension Agent in Horticulture. Uh, he's going to uh, tell us a little bit about our uh, Texas Superstar program. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Mung Mung. I was um, 
glad to be here. Uh, I feel like uh, I'm joining this esteemed group. This is my first presentation, so uh, I guess I will learn the secret handshake later on. So, uh, so what I want to do is talk about uh, some of the new uh, additions to the Texas Superstar program. So, uh, next slide, please. Um, as you can see uh, on the uh, left, we in Texas uh, grow through multiple zones, um, uh, from zone 6A all the way down through 9B, and I think maybe now even uh, further south, we may even start to hit 10A. So um, finding a plant that can do well across all of these zones in Texas is a challenge. Uh, the image on the right is rainfall. So uh, you could see far west, uh, rainfall is under 14 inches, and then you come all the way across to the east and we're above 54 inches. So finding plants, whether they're annuals, perennials, uh, shrubs, uh, the plants that have, have made it into the program, um, they've got to be quite hardy. Uh, they've got to look good in the landscape. They've got to look good at retail. Uh, in order to um, make the cut. Next, please. So how does this all work? There are four initial testing session uh, 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 stations, uh, Overton with Brent Pemberton and College Station, San Antonio and Lubbock. So these four initial stations give us uh, a good idea as to how these plants are gonna perform uh, under the various conditions. Uh, as they make it out of, uh, through the pipeline, they are then uh, disseminated to the agents and we're able to then bring them to our counties to see how these plants are gonna perform uh, for us individually. So it gives us some firsthand knowledge as to um, uh, will these plants do as well uh, for us as they are saying? And in most cases, when they get to that point, uh, they do uh, pass the test. So uh, next up, Next slide. Okay, uh, of course, as in anything else, there is always some POP available. Um, there is a Texas Superstar label and a percentage of that, I think it's a nickel for every label, comes back into the program to help fund it. Um, there is a great book there. That Texas Superstar book has is a great reference. A um, lot of good uh, information and uh, images along with the website. So if you are a grower or if you are a retailer uh, and you want to uh, have a table or an end cap for Texas Superstars, there is some support there to help you um, market that uh, to the general public. Next slide. So what are the new additions uh, for 2020? Uh, so the first one, uh, Evolvulus Blue Days, uh, great low growing annual. Um, may perennialize in certain areas, uh, depending where you are located. Loves the heat. Uh, it does have some salt tolerance. So if you are in the coastal areas, uh, you know, if you're a landscaper, uh, this is something that you're going to use in the front of the bed. Uh, low growing, spreading. Uh, you can see landscape height is about 9 to 18 inches uh, tall, and it's going to get wide. It's going to spread 36 inches. Normally started from unrooted cuttings. Uh, so if you're on the grower side, uh, unrooted cuttings are available. Um, propagation takes about three to four weeks uh, if you're planning your schedule. Uh, and then to finish in a four inch pot, if you go one plug per, uh, it's probably about six to eight weeks. But since that growth habit is, um, you know, has that spreading habit, uh, you can use this in, in in any any type pot, you can use it in baskets. If you're doing combination planters, it will work great as a uh, spiller. Next. Uh, purslane, uh, Portulaca or uh, Olera AC. Uh, great ground, ground cover habit. Colors light up in the full sun. Um, my biggest pet peeve is a lot of the I would say the box stores will have this in the shade, um, mm -hmm. which does it no justice. Uh, if it's in the shade, the flowers do not open. Uh, so the public will not get a good view of it. Uh, but every time I go into an independent, they've got it in full sun and it catches your eye. Uh, two of the series that they talk about um, 
that they've evaluated are Cupcake and Rio Grande. These are both unrooted cuttings. So on the grower side, uh, you'd, you'd have to be aware of that. So you're either going to bring in the uh, unrooted cuttings or you're going to buy liners. Uh, in order to uh, grow this, if you're propagating, it's about two to three weeks in propagation. And it doesn't need, um, since it's got that succulent growth, it does not need a lot a, a long misting period. Uh, and then to finish in a four inch pot, probably about five to seven weeks. Uh, so it, it, it's a pretty quick turnaround, very heat drought tolerant once established. Uh, height is about six to 10 inches tall. And then this is another one that's gonna get wider. It's gonna be get uh, about 12 to 24 inches, but great color, uh, low growing. So again, rock gardens, even in, in combinations or baskets, uh, Portulaca will, uh, will not disappoint you. Next slide. You hey, could even eat it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> hey, Paul, this yes. one uh, in my hometown back in China, we actually call this sunflower. So I'm glad that you mentioned about, you know, the, where you should uh, place this thing. It's called sunflower in my hometown. Right. And, and the interesting thing was uh, two years ago when I was on the uh, out in California for the trials, uh, there is a breeder now that's getting they're getting to the point where these will open under low light conditions. Um, we were there. It was actually it was raining. It was overcast. And, you know, it it wasn't putting on a show like this, but I'd say about 25% of the flowers were open, which is a big uh, deal uh, when it comes to Portulaca. So um, yeah, th th there's a lot of uh, positives in, in, in growing this plant uh, throughout Texas. Next slide. Pentas are great. Um, uh, mostly seed production, uh, but there are unrooted cutting series out there now. Uh, we've got upright habits, we've got cascading forms, we've got short compact um, uh, varieties. Um, so if you're looking at this from a plug, uh, probably about, uh, if you're doing your own seed, about six to eight weeks to get that plug developed, uh, and then anywhere from eight to 10 weeks uh, from transplant to finish. Uh, it definitely brings in the pollinators and the beneficial insects, and this will bloom throughout the entire summer. So um, uh, this is just a great, great plant. There's a lot of varieties out there. There's a lot of series out there and they all, you know, perform extremely well down here. Next slide. Uh, another uh, tidal wave, Petunia. Uh, I can't believe Red Velour is, has recently been named. Uh, the wave series is now 25 years old, so I'm starting to feel old because I remember when that first rolled out. Uh, tidal waves will eat you alive if you stand there too close for too long. Uh, this one's going to get about 24 to 30 inches tall and about 30 to 60 inches wide. So if you're a landscaper, uh, you've got an area that you've got to cover uh, and you want to use as few plants as possible, tidal wave might be something that you want to consider. Uh, it joins uh, Tidal Wave Silver and Cherry, which are already Texas superstars, so it's a nice uh, color mix between the three. On the production side, plug time is about five to six uh, weeks after uh, sowing, and transplant to finish can be anywhere from six to eight weeks. So um, a great, a, a, another great color and another really good habit uh, to have in the landscape. Next one, please. So. That was 2020, and we had a few in 2019, so just want to touch base on those just to get you all caught up. New Look, New Look Celosia is a warm season annual. Uh, landscape height is going to be about 12 to 16 inches. This one may need some deadheading. One of the things I like about this is even before it blooms, it's got that burgundy foliage, so uh, you've got some interest in the landscape. Uh, and then when it does bloom, you've got a nice contrast between that plume type flower against the uh, the darker foliage. This is a seed item uh, and propagation on this, um, well, total crop time is about 11 to 12 weeks on this celosia. So this is probably um, midsection in the bed, uh, could be up front depending on what you've got planted behind it. Um, next slide, butterfly vine. Uh, this is a great vine, Muscagnia. Uh, depending where you are in Texas, it will be semi evergreen. Uh, so down here, uh, mine uh, was was evergreen this year, but I'm sure you go further north, uh, it will drop foliage. Uh, growth rate in general in the landscape is about 10 to 15 feet. 
this one doesn't cling. So if you're a grower, if you're a nursery grower, producer, uh, you're going to have to put some time into training this, uh, whether you trellis it or TP, uh, you know, with the bamboo. So you, you will have to help it along uh, to get it started. Uh, drought tolerance, once uh, established. Uh, the other thing is you get these clusters of yellow flowers in the summer, but then you get these papery seed pods that turn uh, tan to brown as they mature. So uh, you've got some added interest. Uh, I know the master gardeners will collect these and when they do children's uh, programs, they'll have them paint them because they look like butterflies. So you've got something uh, addition to uh, uh, value added uh, with this plant. Uh, you can do it from seed if you collect the seed pods, uh, but normally it is propagated from softwood cuttings either late spring or early fall. So um, a, a great look in the landscape in a great color. Next slide. Uh, the Altheas, Blue Angel and White Angel, these are Hibiscus syriacus. They have excellent upright habit. These images are from the, the ones in my garden. Uh, it just started to bloom and it is loaded with buds. Uh, that plant has probably been in the landscape at least five years now, four to five years. Um, so it's not overly aggressive, um, but it's got a nice upright habit and that will be covered in blooms in the next few weeks. Um, definitely a full sun plant, uh, landscape height about six to eight feet. Uh, it attracts pollinators, and on the propagation side, I would I would tend to recommend the, the green cuttings or the softwood cuttings early to midsummer. Uh, you can take them in in fall winter for hardwood cuttings. It's just going to take a little bit longer uh, for that uh, uh, cutting to uh, to root out. All right, and I think here's the website. So again, if there's any if you have any questions. Um, uh, TexasSuperstar.com uh, is the site. There's a lot of good information. If you're a grower or a producer or, or you're growing these and you want to be listed on the wholesaler list, um, uh, you can contact them. Uh, and if you've got customers that are interested in it, you can point them to or, towards this site. So that is the latest on the past two years of uh, Texas Superstar updates. Well, thank you, Paul. Uh, next up is Dr. Youngkey Joe. And I just want to point out one thing. Uh, Airfong did a okay. Airfong did an excellent uh, segment on uh, Thrips um, color choice on April the twenty third. And I'll, if you don't know uh, where to find that out, uh, I'll, uh, I'll I'll show you at the end of the um, the this uh, chat. Go ahead, Joe. Yankee. Okay, hey, can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Okay, so I'm going to start. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay, all right. So, like, uh, this is here uh, by the, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Cassie, uh, uh, Christy uh, uh, Seeger, the Turquoise Pathologist, uh, Turquoise Extension Specialist up in the uh, Dallas Center. And you can see uh, in the left uh, left side that you can see those are uh, you know dead grass looks like a patch um, throughout the field, and this is the Bermuda grass. I think it's around the Dallas area, and so I. Uh, more in the south, we don't see this disease much, but in the north side of Texas, so it, it could be a north of the Houston, um, I mean, the Dallas and the north of the Dallas until um, those uh, Oklahoma, you can see this kind of uh, <clears throat> patch disease. So it's it called the spring dead spot on Bermuda grass. So uh, Bermuda grass is a primary target for spring dead spot, okay? And if I see the one dead round, uh, you know, patch, then I think it can find out other, you know, factor. But when you see those kind of patch are throughout the field, in the same field, and you can, uh, I suspect there's some, something going on there. Uh, so 
So the, this kind of disease symptom, like that round patch, uh, that grass on the new grass is usually found in, in this time, uh, late spring or early uh, summer when the Bermuda grass, healthy Bermuda grasses uh, grow very fast and recover from the you know, winter dormancy. And so they are free uh, green up, okay? Except this patch was kind of stand out. So then the people questions about what these diseases are, okay? And so, so actually this is a spring that spot fungus is uh, is uh, Ophia sporella, Patrica, and, and Cori, the two different species has been found uh, associated with the spring basket on Bermuda grass. And it is very similar to uh, take a root rot uh, or you know, large patch. So this is uh, attacking the roots and crown and stolon. And their activity actually in the late fall and then during the cool season and wet season, they start to infect the roots and slowly uh, grass is dying. And then you see this, you know, dead grasses and symptoms show up in the in the spring, late spring. Okay. So so that's kind of challenging part. Once you once once you find we noticed uh, this disease patch was uh, the fungus is not active anymore. So the any chemical a fungicide application is not very effective. And so at this point, the only if it's a two large areas are damaged, then you have to kind of patchwork, resod it or reseed it, uh, or you have to put some fertilizers in uh, to, um, you know, the healthy, gra healthy grass around can then fill in those dead spots. So uh, you, when you when you look at those dead spots and you pull out the plants, and uh, usually you found some very dark uh, on the surface of the roots and stolons and uh, the stem. Okay, so this is kind of typical, um, you know, the the dead grasses uh, caused by uh, spring dead spot. So uh, so it's a <clears throat> In the southern part of Texas, we we we, we did see much, uh, but in the northern part of Texas, uh, can be uh, you can see those things. Okay, so uh, really, this uh, this field is going to have a similar uh, problems will be in the later in the fall, and so. The uh, some some application, uh, you know, one or two application in late fall, it will be recommended to prevent uh, this uh, the spring death spot on this Bermuda grass. So Bermuda grass is relatively uh, resistant to the large patch, and um, and take all, which is our more problems on sand Austin grass and zoysia grass, uh, but is um, you know this. Uh, Spring death spot could could be a problem in uh, some of the area. The interesting uh, part is the spring death spot is more problems in maintained uh, turf, Bermuda grass field, a sports field, or commercial field, or resident uh, area where have uh, well maintained high input fertility input uh, fields are more susceptible um, to this uh, disease. Okay, so it's a it's a difficult to manage, uh, one of the difficult to manage uh, the disease. However, is um, if this, this history of this spring death spot is something preventative uh, uh, fungi program is needed in the late season in the fall. That's what I have today. Becky, your turn. My turn. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about infiltration today because I am working on some grants to look more at this and it is just a topic that I am finding very um, interesting and also just with my experience working with a lot of people's uh, landscape areas, 
This is uh, one of the biggest challenges that we have in Texas for a variety of reasons. You know, we, there's a lot of talk about how do we change our irrigation practices to optimize irrigation. You know, we have the Texas ET network and Water My Yard, which are great resources. Um, but there's also the concern of like, how do we capture more rainfall and retain that in the landscape. So this is my cool animation, not as great as Irfan's, unfortunately, because it's not, you're not slapping anything, but um, I did just want to kind of remind, you can go ahead and do, I think there's four among them, you can do all four of them and that's fine. Yeah, for simplicity. Um, so basically I did want to kind of go through some very foundational things about why it's important that we maintain healthy vegetation in the landscape. Um, whether that vegetation is turf or ornamentals or, you know, per, you know whatever it is, um, when we have areas of bare soil in the landscape, we typically see reduced infiltration in those areas. We see increase in runoff. Um, there's a lot of new research studies that are coming out now that are really pointing to the fact that it's no longer these big agricultural uh, operations that are really contributing to nutrient pollution, but more and more, it's us, the average Joe in these big urban cities where, you know, I'm in DFW today, and Laura's in DFW, we have like 8 million people here who may choose to go to Home Depot and buy five bags of fertilizer and throw it out on their yard with this kind of more is more mentality. And so it's good for us to really think about how can we improve infiltration in the landscape, not just to help capture and conserve our water resources, but also to keep things from moving into our stormwater and, and surface water that we don't want to go in those places, including fertilizers as well as pesticides. And you'll, we'll even see some bacterial movement. So um, there was a study that came out a while ago looking at what comes off of roofs, and they found that roof water contains really high concentrations of certain bacteria from things that poop on your roof. So, you know, if you've got pets and things like that, you know, remember all of those things are in your landscape as well and can move. So, um, we can move forward there to the next one. Yeah, so I guess, uh, you know, in addition to that too, we also know that when we have active healthy vegetation in the landscape, we have some temperature and noise abatement as well. So those are some nice benefits too. Um, and these are just some little studies that have been looking at how different types of vegetation can improve infiltration. So I just thought I would share them because they're kind of interesting to me. And um, so this one was looking at different trees and their ability to penetrate uh, through subsoils that were heavily compacted. So not the surface stuff that maybe is a little easier for us to tend to, but things that are much deeper. Uh, and they specifically looked at black oak and red maple. Um, and they found that these species were able to penetrate through those compacted subsoils, and they actually saw that they could increase infiltration rates by an average of 153%. So um, that's a pretty significant improvement in infiltration from including some of these uh, in there. And, um, you know, they basically just said, we, yeah, we think having some of these tree species in your landscape can really significantly improve infiltration on this much deeper level. And then next one, Mung Mung, perfect. Um, and then uh, I will say too, um, I ended up not putting it in here, but there are several studies too that even say that just with turf grass areas or grassland areas that we see a significant increase uh, in infiltration rates because we can think of all of the roots that that vegetation creates as these channels for water to move into the soil. Um, there's also a lot of studies to kind of point to the benefits of compost and organic matter in gardens and even turf grass areas for improving soil quality uh, and permeability. And, you know, one of the big questions I get, we've got a lot of diversity in our soils here in Texas, uh, and some of those soils are very, very challenging to manage. Uh, we have soils that are extremely sandy. We have a lot of shrink swell clays here in the state of Texas that can be very prone to compaction. We also have a lot of areas where we have very poor water quality. College Station is a great example where we have a lot of sodium and bicarbonates in the water there, and that can affect soil structure and all of these things culminate together to make it very challenging sometimes to maintain healthy vegetation and have good infiltration. And so um, compost is one pretty straightforward way to help improve soil properties. Now, this comes with a catch, which is that compost can be very diverse. There's 
good compost and there's not so good compost. And, you know, the benefits that we see from anything that's natural or organic like this can be highly variable depending on the unique environment that we uh, introduce it to. Um, but this is a study that kind of looked at, you know, did compost incorporated into the soil appear to improve infiltration? Um, they found that the compost reduced the concentration of many cations and toxicants in the infiltrating water, so it kind of served as a filtration system, uh, and that, uh, that, that there was also significantly improved turf grass establishment for soils that had compost incorporated in that kind of eliminated the need for uh, pre-plant fertilization and early fertilization in the landscape. So I thought that was kind of cool. And they did say that with these materials they use, that it actually led to an increase in some cases with nutrient loading, uh, you know, for water leaving the property because compost is going to be very rich in nutrients. But they said that was kind of variable. So next slide. So one thing I always like to remind people of, because we have a, a very diverse audience on here, um, and you know, things that seem sometimes intuitive to us that do this for a living are not always intuitive to other people. And um, I can't tell you how many times I've seen people plant new sod on top of existing sod, um, maybe multiple times where there's like three layers of sod and, uh, you know, anytime you do a landscape renovation of any kind where you're introducing new plant material and you have bare soil, it's a great opportunity to renovate that soil through cultivation and the incorporation of amendments like compost or, or other things that work best when they're soil incorporated and kind of taking advantage of that when you're considering renovation. So, really being mindful of what goes into site preparation. If you are a commercial landscaper, like this should be a top priority for you when you're designing sustainable landscapes. Um, it's not just plant selection and everything else, but how do I prepare this soil to really be, um, have good permeability, good infiltration, to really support um, vigorous root development. Um, and those should be things that we think about because unfortunately, um, on the builder end, when a lawn is built initially, this is often something that is like completely ignored, right? We remove, we remove a lot of the good soil, we compact it, we, we fold in the trash. And so it kind of creates a challenge for a lot of landscapes. And so just thinking about that, um, incorporating in these things and thinking about tillage, if you are doing a turf grass area, of course, you still wanna make sure that that area is level and firm for the sod, but just not compacted. Next slide. I do want to talk briefly about gypsum. We don't have enough time to go into this in a lot of detail today, but this is, I feel, an amendment that is commonly misunderstood by people. Um, gypsum is something that can be really beneficial if you have a sodium issue specifically. So if you have very poor water quality that's high in gypsum and you have soils that are significantly, or excuse me, high in sodium and you have soils that are significantly affected by sodium, uh, what it can what can happen is that it affects the structure of that soil. And so um, what we'll see is that the soil doesn't aggregate as well in the presence of that sodium and we lose a lot of the structure and it becomes almost like a concrete. And you can actually do these, uh, there's, you can do these kind of like aggregate stability tests where you look at the stability of your soil aggregates and how much that sodium has affected it. But also usually you just know, <laughs> you've got a, you've got a sodium issue, you're going to see that in multiple, manifest in multiple ways. But um, gypsum can um, be used to help ameliorate this problem. Um, it's not necessarily a permanent solution, but you can have some, uh, a routine where you're applying this at a regular interval to have benefits. And, um, you know, basically the calcium in the gypsum will, will work to displace soil sodium and kind of flush it, help you flush it from the root zone. And so, um, you know, if this is something that you, you think you're interested in or you live in a part of the state where you feel this would be beneficial, you know, I would suggest, I always suggest start, start with our soil testing lab and, and talk a little bit to Tony Proven, who I think is very knowledgeable, sometimes arguably too knowledgeable. He arguably has too much knowledge, okay? Uh, <laughs> but he can be a really good person who, uh, to kind of pick his brain and get some good thoughts on this and whether or not it's a good fit for you. Um, similar soil testing labs will have similar input as well, but this is something that if, if sodium is the issue that's compromising infiltration in your landscape areas, this is something you can add to your program to help improve that.
like next yeah and then my last little thing is just have good vegetative coverage choose native and adapted plants that are going to thrive in our native soils and are going to produce deep healthy roots that are going to help with water movement um, for turf grass areas, as a general rule of thumb, taller grass equals deeper roots. We talked about this a little bit last time. Again, we don't necessarily want it to be two feet high, um, but if we're on the upper end of the recommended height range, those deeper roots can offer the added benefit of improved infiltration. Make sure that your irrigation practices are also designed to stimulate deep root growth. If you water too frequently or too shallowly, you create codependent plant babies that ultimately do not develop very deep roots uh, and that will show up as well in your infiltration. So um, deep and infrequent, you wanna torture them just enough to really help them be stronger. Uh, cycle and soak is a great practice for improving infiltration where you have heavy or steeply sloped uh, landscape soils. Um, and that's where we kind of pulse water in more gradually and program the irrigation system to do that for us. Um, and then, you know, cultivate and amend, you know, take care of your soil. Don't overdo it. There's people that overdo it. I had a guy put two inches of mushroom compost on his Bermuda lawn last year. Uh, it was not good, okay? Um, but there are ways, things that we can do to improve the health of the soil, and it's just something that we don't want to overlook um, because it can be a really important part. So that's just what I wanted to share today, so. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Becky. I have only uh, two pictures here and I wanna uh, quiz you guys, uh, you know, look at your knowledge. You know, what is this? Uh, and uh, in the poll, I'm gonna send, I'm gonna launch a poll. Uh, you know, what's, uh, what's, what do you think? What's, uh, the poll is open. Uh, think about what's, uh, uh, what's causing this uh, leaf damage? Caterpillar, sawfly, leaf cutter bees, Japanese beetles, bagworms. Anyone? Five, four, three, two, one, zero. I'm gonna release the uh, the result. What is it? How many of you got it right? So it just uh, it just started to show up. It just started to show up in the uh, in the landscape. So uh, catch them when they're small. Catch them when they're small. Bagworms. So these are bagworms. Okay. Um. So uh, this is the end of our. Uh, uh, chat today and I just want to remind you that the previews for next week's uh, chat and the recording of this week's and previous week's uh, chats are all available uh, at this uh, Facebook at this Facebook page chat with the uh, Green Aggies and I hope you could you know post your questions there you know uh, so that we you know we know what you're thinking what you, uh, matters the the most to you and um, and now let's uh, um, see what questions we have from the audience.